Hello. Um, the first thing we saw was actually good application of technology. I will talk about where technology and society usually tends to collide. Um, basically, increased productivity and connectivity have have had huge impact. They shifts or they shifts society currently, which are similar to the industrial revolution. And what's going on today echoes basically what was going on back in the day. Um, it basically changes how people live together and interact, and that's basically at the very heart of politics. Politics from Greek polis city, which is basically everything related to of, for, or relating to citizens or how people interact. So, like roughly 200 years ago, there's actually a big struggle, which is to humanize techno technological progress. And there is no really tight definition of what a smart city actually is, but what it boils down to in most cases is that you use machines to help run society. And leveraging data to inform public policy isn't exactly new. This, for example, is a map drawn by John Snow. Yes, actually the name. He was a doctor in London, and it's a map of the cholera outbreak of 1854. So he basically mapped where all the sick patients were and was able to track down a pump, which was the source of the infection. So that's basically using data for public policy for good. This is the, the front cover of the so-called Strop report. It basically touts the annihilating of 30,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto in, 19, in May 1943. And it was possible in part due to complete census data the Nazis had. So basically this report trumped the, the fulfilling of a public policy goal using data. But not only data itself has been used. Even computation and automation has been used in the last hundred years for, for politics or to shape how societies work. And the Cold War actually provides a well-documented case. There was one side which had a revolution in 1917. And the Bolsheviks basically wanted to make a society where everyone would be equal and free, which is sort of what's promised with smart cities today. And like today, like many utopias today, technology was at the very heart. But also, remind, I want to remind you that equality doesn't mean equity. Equality is basically everyone having the same start, but equity is actually about everyone having the same outcome, which also a thing that often gets confused. But in the Soviet Union, the technocrats basically looked at people as atoms, and they believed that Marx had discovered the scientific laws of society. So engineering became a guiding principle on how to reach this new utopia, and technology became central. Basically, electricity became the ICT of the day, and it was of the heart of the Golero plan, the first five-year plan by Lenin. As it said, you can, you can read down here, it said communism, uh, sorry, Communism equals Soviet power plus electrification of the whole country. People were supposed to be, or to, supposed to become scientific beings. They were to understand and control the machines rather than being enslaved by them. And as Trotsky put it, man will become immeasurably stronger, wiser and subtler. His body will become more harmonized, his movements more rhythmic, his voice more musical. All forms of life will become dramatically dramatic. The average human type will rise to the heights of an Aristotle, a Goethe, or a Marx, and above this ridge, new peaks will rise. So the power to shape this new society were with those who could master technology. They were called the bourgeois specialists of the time, because they were a leftover of the revolution. They of course thought of society as a machine-like thing, and of course they bred more engineers. And this actually became so dominant that Anatoly Vasilyev Lunacharsky, who was the first People's Commissioner of Education, actually said to Stalin, it is as if discovering it is possible to live with four fingers, they have decided to cut off the extra finger. So in 1937, there was a purge by Stalin, mainly targeted at the old Bolsheviks. Also, the special engineers were replaced by young party cadets, among them Leonid Brezhnev and Nikita Khrushchev, and their narrow education, as pointed out by Luhanskyi before, based, made them not question Stalin. There was a new society. The new society would be planned like a piece of engineering, because that's what we're trained to do. And it actually stems from experience in World War II, where efficient factory planning saved Russia from the, from the Nazis. So now there were to be technical solutions for everything. 
The Goths' plan was a bureau to decide and control everything from Moscow. Information was collected, a great plan devised, information spread out. You can think of it as a giant map reduce on a whole society. They were, they were using plan indicators, and they planned for everything. They planned for a number of toothbrushes to be needed, they planned for a number of coffins to be needed, they even planned the number of arrests to be made by the secret police. What started as rational planning actually yielded absurd behavior. For example, one plan indicator was the tonnage of the freight transported per kilometer, and that resulted in trains full packed with lumber and wood just going around in circles because that was the indicator for success. So, in 1953, Stalin died and Khrushchev came to power. And he realized that root was actually at the complexity was actually at the root of the problem. And he also realized that Stalin's brutal terror held society together and not scientific planning. So he attacked the bureaucracy openly, and now prices were introduced. And that means centralized prices for over two, uh, 15 million items, uh, 25 million items. So, and also they shifted power away from Gazplan, the central planning agency, and added more regional planning, but this basically just added more complexity. And as this didn't turn out well, they turned to the new science of, so, no, new so-called science of rational control or cybernetics. Cybernetics from the Greek kubernau to steer, drive, govern, or direct. Now computers were to be used to forecast scientific and technological progress. Later, Brezhnev was replaced by Khrushchev, but Brezhnev still believed in the promised land. Now, consumer reports were introduced. And while the standard of living on average was rising until 1975, it then plummeted and yielded the so-called years of stagnation. So the Soviet leadership gave up all attempts on t attempting to reform the plan, and the economy basically turned into a strange pile of rituals. So the other side was shocked by Sputnik in 1915. Sputnik 1 broad, broadcasted a signal of scientific progress, which was not expected by the Americans. But what was basically a metal sphere could also be a nuclear warhead. And you have to remember that just 12 years ago, the deadly or never fading kisses of Enola Gay and Boxcar, which is on Nagasaki, Hiroshima, we have just 12 years ago. Does anyone know what that is? That is a shadow of a person who was standing near the site in Hiroshima where the bomb got dropped and his shadow got burned into the wall. So you can remember what a hellhole that must have been. And of course the Americans knew that and so they were afraid of the Russians. And so the US strategists also believed that uncertainty led to chaos and chaos would to war eventually. So they turned to mathematics because mathematics sounded rational and reasonable and would hope to cope instability. So the RAND Corporation was set up. The RAND Corporation was staffed by young scientists and financed by the US Air Force. They used mathematical models and computers, again, to calculate and predict the world. They turned to game theory to, because it offered guidance in uncertain environments. Everyone was supposed to be a rational player with some information on what the capability of the other side was. So it was the job of the strategists to keep the equilibrium, to keep the balance. And the most rational move in this environment is to ensure your own survival and not shoot first. So Albert James Wallstetter devised a system of missile silos, submarines, and 24-7 bomber fleets in the air to ensure the capability to strike in case the Soviets would strike. It was called the delicate balance of terror. This strategy was refined further under John F. Kennedy and Robert McNamara who became uh, defense minister. Robert McNamara has run the Ford company before and used rational planning to reap up profits there. But then there was the missile gap. And it turns out that while the Americans were afraid that the Russians have lots of missiles, as you can see on the different graphs, the Russians actually, or the Soviets actually just had four of the 600 projected. And since their locations were known and the locations of military installations were known, a new doctrine became the one of selective strikes. So Hermann Kahn actually argued for controlled nuclear war. So cities became pawns in this global game of chess, and civil defense was taken seriously. That's where a lot of the duck and cover videos come from, you may know from that era. 
So then was the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it was the ideal testing ground for all these new theories. But then, when faced with an actual crisis, the strategist couldn't advise John F. Kennedy. And so what he did on October the 22nd was to promise a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union in case those missiles are launched. So fear and exchanges solved this crisis, and not mathematical reason. So in this whole process, the Cold War becoming, became an engineering problem. The, the idea of a political conflict faded away. You were to supposed to keep the balance between power and system. And that also faded away the very idea that this conflict could be solved with political means. It also became more absurd in Vietnam, where systems analysis and game theory was used extensively. In Vietnam, there even were flowcharts on how soldiers should proceed on enemy, vill enemy villages. And all it was, was so severe that it culminated in what's called the McNamara fallacy these days, which is relying only on quantitative observations without taking others into account. And if you want a really current example, look at the drone, drone strikes by, of the, by the United States. Michael Hayden actually said they kill people based on metadata. If you fit a pattern, no matter why, and then you're basically fair game. And the, the patterns they used, as it came out, they, they trained them on four couriers of so-called terrorists, not the actual terrorists themselves. And it's if, like, you say, you, you take a poodle, or you take an image of five poodles, train a computer on it, and then require him to identify all dogs. And then you bring a parrot, a hamster, two fishes, and then you decide they're all secret poodles. Um, to use an inappropriate color scheme, in this game, white people win, brown people die. So machines basically a hard-coded racism. And this basically reflects power and privilege on a global scale, and it's made possible by, running, by letting machines run large parts of it. So what the rationalists usually offer is a controllable world, but what they actually create is a fiction. This is actually called the iatronic disease from Greek iatrus healer. These are usually pains or sufferings inflicted by attempting to heal or fix something. One popular example is Adam, uh, is Adam, Ada Lovelace, you may know. While you know her as one of the first computer programmers, she actually had an opiate habit, a really, really bad one, but she managed to kick the habit, but, but then was bled to death by her doctors. So most people think that the world is a simple enough system to be controlled by the methods of engineering and science. But look at how the crumbling Soviet Union actually yielded all the complexity and the chaos the USA feared in the beginning. So rolling out technology on large scale and letting it interfere with politics on a large scale tends to freeze the world in power and therefore it tends to privilege those who already have all the privileges. So but free deep open source software has ways or can offer a way to cope with it. And I'm actually taking some of my background in disaster response. And so there are things to learn. And just to remind you, the free deep open source principles are basically you can run the program as you wish, you can study the program, how it works, and change it. You can redistribute copies, and you can distribute copies of your modified versions. So if you think of it, the first two actually the first two actually are about access. You should have access to the very fabric your life runs on. And the other two are about participation. You should be able in, in participating in how your life is governed. So they both are about actually about enabling change. And to do good things with computers, there's actually more than just creating a repository and declaring code as law. So along the same lines, I offer four similar principles. The first one is do whatever you do, do it with a purpose. Think about what you're building and why you're building it. Has it already been done? Is, is what you're making actually likely to, to create a good contribution? Also, put some thoughts on it. Is what you're actually seeing as a problem actually a problem? And also look at who is left out of your solution. Like, what about accessibility? What about people with impairment? People can be blind, people can have missing links. Then also think about what is your minimum baseline in terms of technology. Do I need a constant network connection? That's one of the reasons why Bitcoin failed in Africa. And also think about nefarious users. 
And on that, oh yes, we should talk about data. Mitigate the risks for, of data early on. Data is basically a toxic waste. And like every poison, it can help in small doses, but usually kills in large quantities. Try to collect as little as possible and try to anonymize as early. Think about what happens if all your data gets stolen or leaked. Who is at risk? What are the other data sets out there which the information you're collecting could be correlated with? And also, if you absolutely have to collect data from people and can rely on non-personal open data, ensure informed consent. And informed consent means consent is freely given, informed so people know what they're giving up and why, unambiguous and specific. So just saying I'm collecting this data and certain laws may apply is not enough. Also think about data ownership, like who owns the data. So then further on, talk to your users and don't talk about them. There are processes like co-design to engage the community you're working with or you're trying to help with early on. Collect feedback from your users, but avoid tracking them if possible. And finally, be an adult. Know when your project is, is done and communicate when that is reached. Document what you do. Document why you do what you do, the scope of what you're doing, what explicitly is not in scope. And yes, please use open source software because then you actually can be accountable to everyone who's using your software. And since we're engineers, we are used to a world where problems have answers or problems have solutions, there is something called wicked problems. And especially if you deal with people, wicked problems are bound to arise. So how to recognize a wicked problem? It's, there are some warning signs, like if you can't describe the problem definitely and there seems to be no stopping condition. It's like, how do you know that you have a good social system? There isn't any hard metric for it. Then if your solutions can't be true or false, but only good or bad, or even you only have to can choose between two worse options. If your problem can be seen as an indicator of another problem, or if you have just one attempt at trying your solutions, then step back, take a deep breath, because it's a really serious problem you're tackling. So, and after all, it's okay to abandon an idea. So yes, dream about the smart city. Dream about what a better world looks like and do it in terms of technology if you wish. Dream, but talk about how life for most people will be. And tell me, Tell me how people can share or not share what they want. And tell me how people can contrib contribute what they can. And tell me how people can get the safety and protection they need to prosper as they should. So yes, use your machines to make the world a better place. And please take care of your fellow humans. Thank you. Thank you uh, are there any questions for him about the smart city? Uh, if not, I have one. Um, okay. Are you? I mean, you outlined some principles earlier on, right? Yes. Um, about project design and responsibility. Yes. Are you personally in a position to play any role in influencing this? Yes. Every actually, everyone is. Um, depending on on where you are, you're either in the technical position by making certain technical choices about what you use. Um, then maybe you have access to people who run those things. Maybe people who run those projects come to you for advice. That's why also I lined out a few hints on where to get further information. So yes, there are different levels of access, but basically everyone can contribute. Okay, if there are no further questions, then let's thank him again and we'll be prepared for the next one. Thank you.